everybody. My name is Terry Irwin. I'm the head of the School of Design here at Carnegie Mellon. And this is part of our Design the Future lecture series. Be sure in the wrong place. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Alan Chachanov, who is actually kind of like an extended member of the family here at Carnegie Mellon. He's been here before, he's a good friend of many of us, so we're delighted to have him back. Alan is the chair of the Multidisciplinary Products of Design graduate program at the School of Visual Arts in New York City and a partner of Core 77, the design network serving a global community of designers and design enthusiasts that's been going since 1995. Prior to SVA and Core 77, Alan was a product designer focusing in the medical, surgical, and diagnostic fields as well as on consumer products and workplace systems for a wide range of clients, such as Herman Miller, Johnson & Johnson, Federal Express, Kodak, AC Nielsen, Oral-B, Crunch Fitness, and many others. Alan also lectures widely internationally at professional conferences, including IBSA, AIGA, and IXDA, as well as in academia. He's been a speaker and guest critic at various schools, including Yale University, Columbia School of Business, RMIT, IIT, and right here at CMU. He's moderated and led workshops and symposia at the Aspen Design Conference, the Rockefeller Center at Bellagio, Compost Modern, Winter House, and is a frequent juror in design competitions. He's been named on numerous design and utility patents and it has received awards from the Art Directors Club, The One Club, ID Magazine, and Communication Arts. So you get my drift. I could go on naming Alan's accomplishments, but it would simply take up too much time. So I'll conclude by saying that Alan is a good friend and the type of colleague you call on when you need to run your ideas by someone and who will always push you to color outside the lines, be brave, and take risks. Those people are rare. And we're all likely to leave here tonight thinking a little bit differently than we did when we walked, we walked in the door. Now, would you please join me in welcoming Alan Chachanov. It's going to give you a hug. What happens, if, what happens if I need Wi-Fi? I'm like all, I'm all worried. Yeah. Um, I am uh, completely honored to be here. It's been a few years since I've been um, visiting, and I recognize the halls and some of the rooms, and um, an amazing experience with some of the students uh, already uh, this afternoon. So i um, very excited to be here. Um, go ahead. Uh, so my thesis um, might have been to design anything is to design everything, which is something that I, I believe more now than I ever have um, in my entire design life and design life as an educator. Um, this is a big statement, so it would be best to illustrate it. Uh, we could take an example um, of um, a logo. Uh, so um, a logo would have to be seen in uh, its context, uh, maybe on a poster or a swag bag. Um, if you have a logo, you're probably going to want to use it on social media, in which case it's running on platforms. You'd have to know something about that. Uh, platforms run on algorithms, um, and algorithms don't run on privacy, but they probably should. So you'd need to know a little bit about that if you were designing your logo. Um, also, social media happens over time, so you'd need to understand that. Uh, when you're thinking about time, you're thinking about experiences and then user experiences, which would uh, necessitate you understanding something about behavior, psychology, uh, access, privilege, bias, uh, and social justice in general and in, in particular. Um, also, if you were in this area, you'd be uh, interested in user acquisition. If you were interested in user experiences, in which case you'd probably be interested in money or you'd need to know something about money. Uh, and a particular kind of money here, um, venture capital money in terms of user acquisition, you need to understand that. Um, you'd be in service design, um, but if you were in service design, you'd also maybe want to think about services and servers, uh, in which case you need to think about server farms and energy consumption and hardware um, and software. Oops, sorry. Oh, no. 
Um, server farms, energy consumption, hardware and software. I don't know how lucky I was to stop right there. Uh, and then you'd be deep into smart objects, in which case you'd also be thinking about IoT um, and Arduino, which we love, um, and sensors. Uh, and um, this response time is t tricky on this, and batteries. Uh, and at some point, you'd need a hardware strategy. Um, because you need a hardware strategy, because everybody needs a fucking hardware strategy. So if somebody asks you, like, do you like my logo, um, you could say, I love your logo, but what's your hardware strategy? <laughs> and you would probably be, like, right on there. Like, you, that would be the logical question. Um, after that, you know where you are now. Um, you're in virtual reality meetings, and across the hall from there is the augmented reality meeting, and hopefully there's the mixed reality meeting, which sounds sort of spicier. Um, and, uh, and then AI, of course, and machine learning, which is not the same thing, but sort of. Uh, computational design, which I had some fun with there because I couldn't fit it. Uh, ALG everything. Uh, transition design, uh, sustainable design, Research-led design, design-led research, which I would prefer. Uh, ethnography, of course, systems mapping, speculative design, fictional design, discursive design. Apparently, they are all different. They actually are all different. Um, and the nuances there are interesting and critical design. Uh, I made that criticality. Uh, policy design, which I'm very excited about. Information design. Um, and then magic. Uh, which people deny. They're like, design is not magic. And I'm like, it kind of is magic. And maybe you should like, you know, own that a little bit more. Um, and this is not even everything like, at all. Right? There's so many things missing on that list. Um, so I think I will give this up. Uh, today I'm not going to talk about everything. Uh, I'm actually going to try and talk about almost nothing. Um, and so the title for today is Underdone, What's the Least That Design Could Do? Uh, now, I come by this like super honestly because um, for most of my life, my days of my life right now, I'm at um, SVA uh, chairing this uh, department called MFA Products of Design. Um, I am proud to point out that um, we, uh, our logo is misspelled. Um, I think it's a little nervy to misspell the word design in an MFA design program, which would either like knock you out or, I don't know, test you for a sense of humor. But we use design to make you read the word design. Um, and uh, we overdo everything in this department. And I want to give you one example, and this is going back as far as I can go back. Uh, so at the very first open house, before we had a space, here's Aisha Brussel, um, we, uh, and here's Bill Mogridge, who was actually going to teach in the program, but he had passed away um, just a year before the program started. So we were very upset about that and miss Bill. Um, it would have just been so amazing with the students. Um, but we knew that we had to feed people at this open house. And so in Union Square in New York, there's this guy who does these sand mandalas. Uh, and this is how they start, and this is how they end. And they happen over, I don't know, two or three hours, and lots of people are photographing them. He has these bags of sand, and he's got his um, knee pads, and he essentially just grabs a pile of a different color and then, like, surgically draws with it. He's, like, really good at that, and it's mesmerizing to watch. And so this looks really difficult, and I'm like, ooh, I love difficult things. Um, why don't we feed people? Um, we'll have them make, like, food mandalas. Right? And so this is Emily Baltz did a, did a sketch. Um, and so that's what we did. We, uh, we cut up the food, probably not small enough, it turns out. Uh, and the food would be the design material, right, the sand. Um, and then we would hang, <laughs> hang pitas from the sky for some reason. I don't know why, why, but it was pretty great. And so this was a setup. And people came. And there were instructions, right? And so people did it. And then to, again, make it harder, uh, what, what would happen is we had a copy stand nearby, and this would be much easier now, but in, this was eight years ago. So we'd take a picture with this DLS, DSLR, and then the picture would be wirelessly sent up to the internet, and then onto Flickr, and then projected out of a projector, so that students could actually see what lunches other prospective students were carrying on their way to sit down to eat. <sighs> so a couple examples. Uh, so some interesting symmetry here. Um, this I like. It's, it's not really a mandala, but it's like there is a there's a you know mirror down the middle. So I like that. Um, this person didn't get it. 
not interested. Um, and, uh, and this person, ooh, F plus. Like, didn't like the open house, didn't like our little reindeer game for the food activity, probably didn't apply. Unless they sort of secretly did, and they're like some star student that I didn't know, and this is their, their little secret. Um, anyway, so we always do the most that we can possibly do. Um, but what if we didn't do that? What if we did the least we could do? So um, this also, I think, is arguable. Because for those of you, some design fans, and Dieter Rams is enjoying like, a newfound uh, popularity right now. He has these 10 principles for good design, which are really like the stone tablets of design for lots of people. And number 10 is good design is as little design as possible. Right? Which seems compelling. But what if we took it kind of literally? So exactly how little design could we get away with? What if we made literally made the design little? So here in Canada, when you get a pizza and little plastic things, they made little chairs around the table. What if we made it so that people might not notice the design? <laughs> what if we took the dumbest part product possible and dressed it up in lots of design? So these are electrical plugs, super designed, next to one of my favorite chairs. And phew, they charge your phone, so it's, so it's going to be good. What if we trick people by hiding the design? OK, so how many people have um, Google Maps running on their phone right now? OK, and how many people have Google Maps running on their phone right now, but they don't know that it's running on their phone right now? Yeah, the rest of us. Um, so uh, I don't have a car, probably, in New York. Um, but lots of you do. And you probably you know, hear this like a lot of the time. Oops. Supposed to be audio here. Well, you can all do it. One, two, three. There is a 20-minute delay up ahead. OK. And then you're sad, right? But then. And this really needs to win the design award of human history. You are still on the fastest route. It's just, it's too brilliant. Like, how did they do that? And every time, you're like, yes, I win. And you're like in this traffic jam. Uh, does anyone know somebody who did this at Google? You, CMU people know people. So find out who did this and tell them that this should, this should win. Um, and so that hidden design is there to make you feel good. Um, but what if the hidden design were there to make you feel bad? So um, here's the weather, um, a favorite topic of dads everywhere for some possible reason. Um, anyone's dad obsessed with weather in the room? Oh, all right. So, uh, so here's the high temperature, right? But then there's the feels like. OK, so they made that up, right? That's made up. Um, and they're getting pretty brazen about it. Because here, they don't even list the actual temperature on this map. It just feels like. Because that's going to be hotter and more alarming and make you feel, I don't know, worse. Um, what if we added lots of colors to make it feel even hotter? Also, it feels like a uh, map. And then what if we trademarked it? Right? So real feel <laughs> with a registered trademark. What if we hypnotized people using design that didn't actually exist? Does anybody know this Instagram account? Oh, say goodbye to the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think I have one more. I do. Yeah, this is so good, I could just end this. Thank you. <laughs> it's been great to be back. Yeah. What if we just stuck with Instagram and called it a day? You've all seen this? <laughs> this is the best. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Finally, what if we pretty much just gave up? So this is a recent ad campaign in the New York City subway for Spotify. <laughs> like, for real. Like, this is not photoshopped. That is the actual ad campaign. Lots of vinyl. So apparently, they're purple now. 
Are they even? It's for prints. It was for prints. Ah, okay. Well, now maybe I kind of love this. <laughs> All right, take this out of the thing. We'll, we'll fix it in post. We'll edit this out. What if we finally admitted that everything we design isn't as good as the box it comes in? I had not seen this. This is so great. From Amazon, race car. Place box on floor, carefully placed driver in box, engine noises. I actually think that this writing is like part of the best thing of this, um, but for sure true. What if we confused people about design so much that they didn't even know what to apply the principle of the least design to? Um, so this is one of our recent grads, uh, Will Crum, uh, on his Facebook, and I asked him if I could show this. Uh, two years ago, I was accepted to this program, na na na, self-actualization, that's good, sharing the fruit of last year's labor with his thesis, which is a really great thesis, a link to his website. And then at the end, he says, P.S., as you might have guessed, the next step is the job hunt. Then he puts, if you know anyone looking to hire an interaction designer, a design strategist, or some other type of designer that you don't totally understand, <laughs> let me know. Which I just love that so much. So I laughed out loud and said, I need to show this in an upcoming talk, please. So, um, so I want to uh, look at a bunch of examples about how little design might actually um, be necessary. Um, and I want to start with my favorite thing ever. Um, which I had read about in Doug Rushkoff's book, Present Shock, which I cannot recommend enough still. Um, and, uh, and this is um, Stuart Brand's idea where you would add a zero before the year. Um, and I think I had that in my title slide. So this would be year 02018. Sorry, I keep bumping into things. Um, and that this would give, it would reframe the, the amount of time. So rather than thinking that you were living in a, uh, a 10,000 or a 9,000 year um, period, you would actually be part of a 99,000 year period and that you would think um, differently about it. And I just thought that this was so brilliant. Talk about like, doing something with like nothing. I mean, it's literally a zero, right? Um, and I was lucky enough to be giving a talk at the New York Times um, for their uh, entire design team. I think there were like 50 people in those days uh, in a week or two. Um, and I thought, hmm, they have a date on that. And I've got some Photoshop skills. So I just added a little zero there. Right? And I actually get the paper. Uh, we get the paper in our home uh, every day and still read it. Add a little zero there. <laughs> and so I was on the phone with Liz Danzico, who I'm sure many of you know, a CMU alum and told her about this idea. And I said, you know, I'm really excited about this. I'm also a little nervous. I don't know if you go into the, like, the New York Times design department and like, mess with their homepage exactly. But um, I'm going for it. And she says, this is great, but you need to show it in context. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, you have to show it on the articles. And it's like, she's so brilliant. I was just like, of course. So I was reading the New York Times um, in those days, I still sort of do, um, on Flipboard when I'm not at home. And so I added it to a few, um, a few articles that I found. This is back in 2014. So climate panel, this is great for, for now. It's probably great for always. Climate panel sees global warming impacts on all continents worse to come. And so when you look at this date, you can think like, wow, like in only 2,000 years, and I know that that's, you know, it's a reason why it's, that's two, it's a relatively arbitrary number, but they had already figured this out. Optimistically, pessimistically, it's just like it took them 2,014 years to figure this out. But that zero really changes it, changes it for me anyway. Uh, Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, dies at 82. Like, they were already on the moon in 2,000 years. So some of this seemed actually, it was different. The things that I thought were going to be optimistic seemed pessimistic to me and vice versa. I'm not going to show you the whole set. Um, I did love this one, though. Um, so people are always fighting about whether butter is bad for you or good for you or bad for you. Uh, but in 2014, uh, butter's back. Butter's good for you. Um, so they had figured that out. Uh, recently, I guess three weeks ago, I published um, uh, an article that I'd been working on for a while, the actual material I'd been working on um, about not having meetings. Um, and I gave it this unbelievable link baity title, Change Everything You Hate About Meetings with This One Single Word. Um, and somebody actually criticized the title. I'm like, it was with a wink. Um, it was fun to write that title. And so 
um, we have this thing in our department. I made a poster uh, really the first year of the program, and I have some pictures of it over the years, um, that says no prototype, no meeting. And the idea is that uh, graduate students uh, talk a lot, and they think a lot, and they have meetings to decide to agree on I don't know what. Um, they don't really make a lot of stuff because making stuff is risky and graduate students are old enough to know that decisions have consequences and they don't want to make the wrong decisions. Feel familiar? Um, so they read another book or have another meeting. Um, and so you know, I, I parsed this out in the article, but essentially if the agenda of a meeting is what should we do, walk out of that meeting. Um, and you all have my full permission to do this. Um, uh, your price to enter the meeting is to bring something to the meeting. And it can be anything. It can be like a two-by-two two competitive analysis. It can be a piece of um, research that you don't agree with. Uh, it could be a list of things you don't want to do, frankly. But it has to be something. Um, and then I would also just add for you as a bonus track, if you're having that meeting with yourself, like what should I do, for sure get out of that meeting and just like do anything, make anything. Um, anyway, so this really stuck, and it was really exciting, and it was even a hashtag on, on some of the students' posts. And so we were having a staff meeting, not that I said that word, and um, I was saying, you know, what if we actually, like, didn't use the word meeting? Like, could, could we, like, outlaw the word meeting in this department? Because students still are talking. Um, like, could we redesign that word? And so Alicia Wessler, our director of operations and an amazing um, visual artist, I linked to her um, site in the article, said, well, what about review? And I'm like, that's it. And she goes, no, 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 let's talk about it. And I said, no, you nailed it. Like, it's in the word. If you had a review at 3 o'clock today versus a meeting at 3 o'clock, you'd kind of look like an idiot showing up empty-handed to something called a review. It's in the word. So I went back to my computer, and I downloaded an autocorrect Chrome extension, and I made it autocorrect one thing. So whenever I type meeting, it changes it into the word review. And then I went further, and I went into my iOS and did a keyboard auto whatever, um, and I'll show you how to do it, um, so that I can't type meeting in any software. So the, the Google Chrome is really good because for Gmail. So I lived with that for seven months, and I thought, I should probably write this up. Like, it's time. So I wrote up this thing about, like, no prototype, no meeting. And then um, I was talking to a faculty. Um, let me see. Do I have a screenshot? Uh, Bill Cromie um, said, oh, I could write that extension. Because I don't want you to download a Google extension and then have to do work. I want you to click on one thing and download the no meeting Chrome extension that does one thing and changes one word. So he wrote it. And he wrote a Slack bot which is really devious, because if you're the administrator on a Slack channel and you install no meeting, everyone has it. Right? So imagine how many times the word meeting is being typed in Slack on planet Earth now. Like, I don't know, 400,000? Um, so help spread the word. Uh, when you type meeting into Slack, the Slack bot pops up and it says, um, hey, I noticed that you just typed the word meeting. Um, would you like me to change that to the re review so that people um, always come prepared to future gatherings? Um, and we actually we had to write that. Bill wrote it like super well, like right out of the gate. We had to finesse. It didn't. Want, it wanted to be nice. Um, it didn't want to be like a joke. Um, so the writing of that really, really mattered. Anyway, so you can check it out. So um, here's the iOS how to do this. Um, so for those of you who want to, you know, go all the way, go all the way with me. Um, and then, so there were a couple of reactions. I thought that this would be good because a lot of people in the room will know who these people are. So Jeffrey Zellman said, you got my vote. Fucking brilliant. I'm going for it. And then Paul Ford had tweeted, I think I highlighted it, I'm installing it because really, what do I have to lose at this point? Which I thought was really um, fantastic. Uh, so I have a, uh, like a lesson or two at the end of some of these examples for, for the rest of the talk. Uh, and the lesson here is, like, set ridiculous goals for yourself. Like, my goal for, for the New York Times, and I had made um, Liz a wager, that I could get them to, we'll take it to, le to legal. Like, I know the New York Times can't add a zero. Just think about the, just the legal ramifications of every article that they published. I mean, it could never happen, right? But they could take it to legal. Um, <laughs> So I'm presenting this, just to, to rewind a little bit, in this group. And like honestly, like 45 designers were like totally into it. 
Like you could just see it on their faces that they were excited about the, the possibility, the audacity of this thing. But the design director was not sitting. He was standing like about where you are. You could do this with me. Not amused, like at all. He was not taking this to legal. Because I even talked about the take it to legal. And then I was just like, they're not taking it to legal. Um, but, but I went for it. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to redesign the word meeting. And I, like, I went for it. And so uh, that's, that's my takeaway. Uh, this is Louis Elwood uh, Leach, who did a long thesis, um, sort of a broad thesis called Invisible Possessions. I'm going to show you just like little slices of some thesis projects uh, from some students coming up um, around sort of the notion of, of ownership between humans and their technology. Uh, so here's the HomePod. Um, and so he made a DIY HomePod, which I think is really great, because he didn't want to like, talk to this thing. He wanted to talk to that thing. Um, and you could do this. It was just an old phone that he wasn't using anymore. Uh, this is Somia Iyer, uh, whose thesis was called Prosumerism. Um, and this is a project. It's interesting. It's like the display is like sleeping. It keeps dimming and getting brighter. Um, uh, a project that you might have seen in other places. It's just such a perfectly wonderful, clear idea that when you buy something, it comes in a bag that um, flips inside out. So here, you're purchasing a, a shirt, a top, and you take it out, um, and you turn the bag inside out, and then you know something comes into your home and something goes out of your home. And so then you put that back in the same bag, uh, and away you go. Uh, Josh Korn designed a, a coffee mug called a Multichino uh, that was students design products for um, MoMA every year for possible inclusion in the MoMA catalog, or MoMA wholesale, actually. So we feel really privileged about this. There was an opening um, last spring that was uh, really an honor. <laughs> and um, so this mug uh, lets you create um, every coffee drink there is. Um, it's, all, it's all in there. And so for these, these last three examples, I want to say the solution is already in the problem. We don't have to look very far often. Like you're already holding. You don't have to make more stuff in some sense. Um, this is Smriti Adya, who did really an extraordinary thesis called Upgrade. Um, and she looked at design for limb loss and limb difference uh, and worked with a lot of amputees. Uh, incredible research, of course. Um, lots of subject matter expert interviews, lots of system mapping. I'm showing you that just to show off her animation. There's more actually to it. Uh, spoke to just incredible people and designed along a continuum from individual um, all the way to larger cultural issues. Lots of uh, journey maps, lots of affinity maps. Um, and she um, did projects really along a whole spectrum. She looked at a platform that looks at the economics of prosthetic use. It was really, really incredible what we learned here. Um, some policy design impacted by the economics. Um, and then some industrial design. Uh, there are one-handed controllers out there, and she wanted to uh, design one herself. Did a beautiful job. So there's the 3D model. Here's the hot computer rendering. I think she has a video if it works. if she made the video that like you're supposed to make like if it's got a wink to it, it looks like the video that you're supposed to make um, but those are the projects that I actually wanted to, to show you for this talk this is the project um, this is one of her um, well users and subject matter experts Christina who said that most times at night when I'm not wearing my prosthetic I crawl or hop on the floor from my bed to the bathroom putting on a prosthetic can be very time consuming onerous and for uh, for that single purpose, um, I think this kind of broke Smoothie's heart, right? This just this this image of this woman crawling to the bathroom to pee at night, and so I think in one week Smoothie uh, came up with Swift. So it's analogous to a pair of slippers.
And she can imagine that it would be um, just a free you know, file, or you could order it at Shapeways in different sizes. Maybe you could measure yourself and order one. Um, or perhaps, sorry, I think there's missing a slide, or perhaps um, at Amazon. Uh, and um, the lesson here for me is like so many of the projects, so many of our thesis projects in particular, really turn on one sentence. Um, and you hope that sentence comes in October of a year-long thesis, and sometimes it comes in March. Um, but it happens, and you have to like, be listening to it. Um, it's, um, it's remarkable. I could actually put together a talk of like, the one sentence and how everything changed in the thesis project. This is Tawny Pantig, This Great Violence. This may actually be the most powerful piece of design I've ever seen from a student. Um, and the thing is, I didn't, I didn't even realize how unbelievable this was um, when she presented it, because there were so many projects coming every week. Um, so she did a project on the black male American experience. Um, and she is a female Asian Canadian woman. Um, and so right out of the gate, there were all sorts of really interesting questions about appropriateness and design research. and. Uh, so many of her projects were just unbelievable. I'm just going to show you one um, which had to do with stop and frisk, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And she wanted to, uh, to try and put a dent in stop and frisk, and so she renamed her initiative Stop the Frisk. And what she did, it's quite simple. So this is the receipt that you get when you're stopped and frisked in New York. And you can see some of the fields, right? Um, and what she did is she redesigned this receipt, right? Um, and cynically, but typically, how it's often filled out, right? But the trick is there's two of these, right? So she redesigned it, and there's two. You get one um, as the person who was frisked, and the other one goes back to the station house, right? And at the station house, they are stacked. Yeah. So this has to be the most brilliant piece of data viz ever. No pixels, no computation, like no intelligence at all. Paper and ink. Anybody can make this. Policy, lots of policy meetings, but really incredible. This is a brand new project called Netflix Reveal um, that was led by Andrew Schlesinger um, as part of a project that we did with Omidyar Network over the summer. It was a four-week partnered project, very intense, on the theme of interdependence. Um, so for those of you who think you have very slippery themes, try doing a, a project on interdependence. Um, so the students came up with uh, 14 design interventions, initiatives, uh, products, services, platforms. They're all, you can find them all on the website. Uh, but this is Netflix Reveal. Uh, see what you're missing. So um, this is really about making visible the people, uh, or the backgrounds or the ethnicities of people who make our media products. Um, and it was um, really surfaced by some research um, that the students did um, with this group, uh, Getting Out, Staying Out. Uh, of prison, uh, talking about um, Trump and um, uh, folks from Yemen who uh, were running all of these corner stores in the neighborhood where these guys lived. And there was this day when all the stores were closed. And it just became very clear like that this, this targeted a certain people and that all the stores were closed was the way to see that targeting. And so uh, Netflix reveal. Um, Essentially, uh, you, would load up, you would load up Netflix, and you would get a pop-up saying, uh, in this instance, February 16th is Day Without Immigrants. In support of this movement, programming that includes cast and production from countries targeted for strict immigration or banning will not be available. And to get more information, and here they are. They're not available. The actress is from Mexico. The writer is from El Salvador. The lead actor is from Pakistan. Um, and how far do you want to go? FX director from Iraq, animator, Mike Holder from Chad. Right. Um, 
when you're on Netflix and you want to learn a little bit more about a show, uh, this is what you get currently. So um, the designer added this world map with dots from the countries of where the contributors are from. Okay, so this is a map with dots. There's like not a lot of design here, right? But the point that it's making, in my opinion, is extraordinary. So it's taking something away. Um, oh, sorry, I should say, this is totally doable. Um, there are Chrome extensions that let you filter your um, Netflix queue in all sorts of ways. So I think the MVP, the minimum viable product here, would be a Chrome plugin. And then I guess you take it to Netflix, like you take it to legal, because we know that that works. Um, and you're like, well, Netflix would never do this. And I'm like, are you sure? Like, maybe it's time for Netflix to do this. Like, what has to happen before Netflix can't not do this? Like, at what point do we need to be at where they actually couldn't not do it, right? But they'd need to see it fully fleshed out like that. And that's really the power of design, that the artifacts are so convincing. They look so real, going back to an earlier point, that you can actually have a meeting about them. Now you can have a meeting. Right? There's no talking, hey, what if Netflix, like, you know, you couldn't see programs that were made by foreigners. It's just like, oh, I don't know, I mean, that, that could never happen. And then you'd be on to the next idea that could never happen. Right? So making these things just so of such high fidelity, and yet they didn't take too much. Right? This stuff was banged out along with 13 other initiatives in four weeks. And really the first you know, 10 days or, or two weeks was... Um, was learning about interdependence and trying to figure out what buckets that could be subdivided into. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this is uh, brand new, a week old. Um, this is Stuart Gershman, um, who I grew up with in Winnipeg. Um, and the initiative is called Buddy Check for Jesse. So um, Stuart lost his son Jesse to suicide um, three or four years ago um, and just launched this initiative around supporting mental health. And it's absolutely ingenious. Um, so this is for coaches who teach hockey, who, who coach hockey um, in Canada, but it can happen anywhere. Um, uh, green is the color of mental health. And the idea is that next week, um, players, kids, boys, will, uh, I don't know how much you know about, well, you know about hockey, look where I am, right? So you tape your hockey stick, so instead of using black tape, you're using green tape, right? And in fact, um, Stuart... Uh, got green tape like donated by Canadian Tire and a whole bunch of other retailers. Um, and then coaches can download these um, really support materials because you're like, well, you know, talking about mental health is, is nuanced at the very least. It's hard. And we've got hockey coaches who aren't professionals in this area. And yet the big win is that you're talking to a bunch of boys um, in this case. I'm sure there are girls as well. Um, about mental health, a topic that in some sense you would never talk about, right? So for me, the design material here is permission, right? The green tape gives permission to at least hear a few points about that you are seen, you are recognized. This is like really beautifully written too. Um, so um, I think that this is just doing so much with so little, right? The key to all these um, these last few projects that I'm showing you, though, is to be conspicuous, right? And so I think one of Dieter Ram's other, like, laws is that design should go away. The best design is, is invisible. Can anyone look that up on their phone? There's, there's a law. Um, so I don't know anymore. Like, maybe not. Maybe not on planet Earth right now. Maybe it's, like, emergency time on planet Earth, and your designs need to be really conspicuous, um, and that you use that as a tool for, uh, well, behavior change, ultimately, right? Education, enlightenment, sensitivity, empathy, behavior change. I think that's the order um, that's supposed to happen. This is Maya Soltani, who did a, uh, an app, mocked up an app, also for the interdependence, uh, called Plus Plus Minus. Um, it's really, really great, yeah. 
um, a dating social app that matches users with people who almost agree with them. All right, so the, so the rationale is, is at this point, you are not going to go out with someone who disagrees with you on pivotal issues, right? Um, that we're in these filter bubbles. Um, and the way that most dating apps or even friending apps work is that they match you as best as they possibly can uh, with the people who <laughs> think the same things, believe the same things, right? So Maya's app is kind of shitty, right? It kind of matches you like two-thirds of the time, 66% of the time. And the idea is that if you were going to get to someone who like mostly agreed with you, that maybe you could get to a point in your, if you go for a coffee or a drink or lunch or whatever it is, where when you came around to the, to the areas that you didn't agree on, maybe you would have built enough trust or at least see a human across from you that it wouldn't be, yeah, I'd never talk to somebody like that. I would never be friends with somebody like that who believed that. Um, so Maya did a mock-up here. Um, she pick a side. So here she was saying she's very overt, right? Democrat, dogs. God, those are, you know, one or the other. Um, and, you know, so you have something to fight about. So I actually, I, I had a disagreement with Maya. I think she'd be fine with me, you know, saying it. Um, that I think that this could be, like, sneakier. Um, and I know that it could be sneakier because our students did a project using the Cambridge Analytica uh, data sets this past um, spring. Um, and they are amazing. Whatever you think about them being sold and manipulated, the way that you can correlate people, sort of their fundamental, not sort of their fundamental beliefs of whether they would you know, click on like Captain Crunch or Cheerios is astounding. And we tested lots of it and it was like frighteningly accurate. So I actually think that this should be like sneakier where you ask much more like sort of innocuous questions and that when you go to this lunch, you don't know that this person is a Democrat or Republican or, that, um, or their feelings around abortion or really any hot button issue. Um, maybe you just sort of find it out. And again, the argument would be you find it out late enough where it's not going to like stop you, where you actually could meet someone who doesn't fully agree with you, which I think is really ingenious. And you could totally do this. She had great icons for like friend or romance. I love those. Um, opposites attract, but just the right amount. <laughs> or hanging out with someone who doesn't agree with you 33% of the time, that sounds like a lot of fun, actually. So we use Live Surface for, for these mock-ups, which you should definitely use. It's an amazing uh, Adobe Illustrator plug-in. But you can't download it now because you'll be on the Wi-Fi so, uh, after. Uh, so the lesson here, like, don't finish the job. Like maybe your solution shouldn't be like a solution. It should be, well, an invitation. I'll leave it at that. This is Monaco Tamura, who did a project called Switch. Um, so her thesis, again, so many projects to share with you. I'm just, I'm picking one. I'm trying to show you like how little design can actually potentially move the needle here. Um, so uh, I assume you're all familiar with code switching. Um, we all code switch. We are different. I mean, particularly like when we're with our parents, we turn into our children. That would be like a very safe one to talk to you about. Um, along ethnic and racial lines, this gets very, very complex, right? That you may want to act more American um, in the business world to like get ahead, but that when you're with your ethnic family, that you are code switching, right? Um, and so Monaco... Uh, this was like the perfect project for her because she really has had a struggle um, keeping her Japanese ethnicity being in America. And so a lot of her thesis was about this. And so this, this is like the app that, that she did. Our students, like, they all do products, they all do apps, they all do services, they all do platforms, they all do experiences, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> so, so when we finally met about this, I remember saying, like, Monaco, you have to have it both ways. Like, you are not going to solve this because there are times when you want a code switch and there are times when you really don't. So you need an app that's actually going to not stop you and not start you. It has to do both, um, which is actually um, graphically represented here really nicely. So catch me when I code switch so I can stop and be more of my authentic uh, ethnic self and train me to code switch so I can sound more relevant. And again, the word relevant is like a choice for her. Um, you can put in lots of words there. All right, so let's take a look at um, some moving interfaces. Good? 
good. Uh, and um, it alerts you. You just broke your personal record. You've kept your accent at work for two hours. Keep up the good work. Lots of happy emojis. And then you just switched back to your accent with a very sad. Is that a sad cat emoji? What is that called? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's got a dashboard, some statistics. Okay, but then it gets really interesting here, right? Because Alexa is listening, right? How many people have Alexa at home and think that it's not listening? Like your phones aren't tracking your your location. All right, so here's the two scenarios. Hello, Monaco. You switched 28 times in the last hour. What is going on? You hear that? <laughs> and then. I have searched my archives. You switched back to your accent in your office today. We already talked about this. And I like the fact that Alexa is like getting a little bit of a toot, you know, um, which I think is going to happen because, you know, you've read these articles about how we're training our kids to like, you know, order Alexa around. Did I completely mess up the whole, we're okay on the broadcast? Um, so I think it's only reasonable that Alexa is going to take on a kind of personality um, and people are going to design those, and you'll be able to, like, in some sense, choose them as kinds of services or tonalities to the service. Um, and you're like, yeah, I don't know if that's coming. And I'm like, that's coming. That might already be here. It's, certainly, it's already here in terms of what it's listening to, right, and the ads and services that it's um, pitching to you um, in response. Uh, so the lesson here from this code switch is like get serious about acknowledging that you're not solving problems, you are negotiating problem spaces, in my opinion. I don't know if we solve problems at this point. Um, everything is just so complex, right? I'm not saying that there are no solutions out there, but it's just it's pretty naive the way the designers are talking about like, you know, problem solving. Um, and also that complexity usually involves like a dialectic and like lots of contradiction. Um, this was not simple for for uh, Monaco, and I don't think anything worth your time working on is simple for you. Anything worth working on is going to get hard. That's how you know it's worth working on. But the getting hard is not because you couldn't solve the problem. It's because I think maybe the way you were framing it and this idea that you have all of these ingredients in this very complex equation and you need to like move them around and a little less of this and a little more of this and this has to go over here and these stakeholders aren't even at the table. All of those kinds of things, like that's what design is made of. I think it's what design was always made of. Um, but certainly now, like that's what design needs to be made of. Uh, Andrew Schlesinger um, did a project um, on raising feminine boys. It's really an amazing thesis. I'm going to show you I think, two projects. Uh, this was his thesis, Gentlemen. It's a really beautiful title. Uh, he did a whole bunch of things. I think I'm showing you reimagining these Boy Scout patches. Um, again, just such a slice. Like, you should watch the whole thing. Um, but what's interesting is he puts them on a continuum. And this is another thing that I'll throw in, just it's off topic. But when you are proposing work that is a little bit dangerous or controversial or is asking people to really, like, go out on a limb with you, put it on a continuum. Make it easy for them in the beginning and let them see how far it can go um, as opposed to just dropping them into a place. I think this is a really, really useful tool. Also, it's great for your design rigor that you can imagine any kind of design intervention or problem space at many different stops down the road. Don't just say, I'm going to do this, and then everyone's just like, yeah, people won't do that or nobody will buy that, or you won't get that funded. Right? Do all of these and that one. Um, these will get better, by the way. And when you can ladder somebody up, they might just go for that one. So just um, beside. So, uh, so one of his, his projects, Baby Jim, was how can we help dads bond with their newborns? And there's a lot of precedent uh, around um, new moms uh, exercising with their babies. Right? There's like baby yoga. Um, and there's like jogging strollers. And he's like, well, what if we did something like that for men? I'm not really going to need sound here. Yeah. Are you a new dad? Afraid that a dad bod is on the way? Or can you just not find the time to hang out with your newborn? Well, skip the fears. Lift your baby to shed those pounds. And you'll bond with your baby along the way. 
Just clip your infant into the pattern pending baby gym workout frame to start lifting. You can exercise alone. <laughs> Squats. Bench press. And he wouldn't shoulder kiss press. The baby. You know the kiss drill. The baby on the way or down. if you'd like, you can easily work out with your partner. Baby gym has been designed for versatility. You add the muscle, she tones down, everybody wins. Baby Jim is on a monthly payment plan, only $5.99 for 12 months. So order today. No babies will harm you in the making of this. Please take a five. No like babies will harm you in the making of this. Work out on your own I really love that piece. Um, Andrew did lots of like less, you know, speculative and funny and provocative work. Um, there's a couple um, brand pieces that I did that I think are really amazing. This one. Uh, and a second one here. And again, I'm really just going in and pulling like a little slice from a bunch of these um, recent student projects. Uh, so maybe we could end this by looking at a little bit more design than uh, the least design. Um, and so I haven't shown this project in a while, and I thought it might be fun to revisit. This is uh, Eden Liu's project called Nutshell. Um, so um, for several years, um, I've been using this as a prompt uh, with students. Uh, it's like an eight-week class, seven weeks really, um, and the, the, the design assignment is to redesign the next thing you throw out. So they don't get to decide what they're redesigning, and most importantly, it starts out literally as a piece of garbage. Oh, there's people around the corner. Hello. Oh, there's lots of people around the corner. But now, and my remote doesn't work, so I'm in trouble now. Um, so it starts out literally as a piece of garbage, and then hopefully it ends like you know with a piece of gold. Anyway, so um, what Eden threw out was this uh, sandwich package from Pret, right, for lunch, um, and the students do you know some mind mapping, and she realized you know that it was really about like eating too fast and fast food, and that you know there wasn't a lot of time um, to eat at lunchtime, um, and that really became like her her problem statement, right? People feel too busy for lunch breaks. Uh, they did some storyboarding, a whole bunch of like 100 drawings and three prototypes kind of thing is what we do in the first week. Um, and she came in with this um, in the first week. Uh, and uh, it's, it's funny, right? Uh, and she didn't know how to sew. No offense, clearly. Um, and then there's, there's like a shelf in it where you can like put your sandwich on, on the inside, right? Um, so, you know, what happens when you don't know how to sew? You learn how to sew. Right? And so like, the difference between this first prototype and this second prototype is sort of unbelievable. And yes, the lighting is a little bit, bit better and there's a little bit of Photoshop. But this can just show you like, how real doing something again can make things. Um, and just as a, as a bonus track, like, you make the model the first time to find out how to make the model. Right? The second model is the model. Right? And if you can swing it, really the third model, um, simplifies everything. But a lot of students will build something the first time and then be upset with it and disappointed and it's not going to work. The first time is really just to find out how to do it. So this is really beautiful. Um, and then we take a look at um, some branding. Uh, so this is now called the Nutshell. Sometimes we need a break. Nutshellpod.com. Really beautiful photo, beautifully styled. Same model, right? Same prototype. Uh, and then uh, I asked the students to do fake partnerships with real uh, companies. And I'm going to get to the point when the container store lawyers call me. But first, um, so contain yourself is really brilliant. And this is Natsuki. And you can see now the front of this model has these orange ties. And all of a sudden, like, this is looking like really, really good. Right? Beautiful saturation in the back. Looks very real. Um, and then we do some research. And like, that's one of my things. I think that designers do research too early. And that's that research-led design. Um, I think too early. I think the, the wind leaves your sails. You like, look at all this research. And you're like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, look at all this. And these people do this for a living. And it can just be really dispiriting. And so I'm really in favor of designers just jumping in, make some stuff, have some fun, you know, work with your instincts. Also, you know, you know more than you think you know, typically. Um, but it was certainly time for a little bit of research here. And again, it was a seven-week class. It was like one week of research. But she got really interested in the health benefits of solitude and mindfulness and made a really nice chart here. And you can see how she integrated the logo of Nutshell into this chart. So very, very good, right? Um, and 
it was time for the, the last lens of the seven week class. We do like a different sort of you know, game each week. Um, and this is actually the week that I'm um, working with my students right now. So I, I, if this were next week, I would have shown you a whole bunch of projects that happened like right now, um, where the students actually might be working right now. Um, but this is really valuable. Um, Reimagine your project not as a product or as a service or as a platform or as a thing. Um, redesign it as a lab. So what would nutshell labs do versus what is the nutshell, right? Um, and you should just take this idea. Um, what is the image you think of when you think of the word labs? It's universal. All right, the beaker, right? And the beaker is like smoking and maybe blowing up. Right? Things are supposed to blow up in a lab. It wouldn't be a lab if things didn't like blow up and fail. So you have this incredible license, permission, expectation to actually fail. It's another reason why the word lab is so powerful. Right? So you should just all try that on for size. Whatever you're working on right now, imagine that it was a lab, and then let's and then start to um, you can have a meeting with yourself um, to figure out what that lab would be up to. Okay, so let's look at what Nutshell Labs does. Um, and I found that the quickest way to figure out what a, what a lab does is to look at it as a website. And more importantly, um, the nav. And I have to say, this nav is relatively conventional. Right? So for instance, if one of those nav items was fellows, like maybe they were reimagining a fellows program, this would be, nutshell labs would be a whole other thing. Right? Anyone have a suggestion for what else could be up in the nav that would be like reframing what this thing was, this organization? Uh, experiments, that's a little redundant. Research. Research. Perfect. Right? Change everything. So mocking up websites I think is super fun and super easy. Uh, just Squarespace or Wix. But this is what you should be paying attention to. If you really want to tell people like what the agenda is or if it's speculative design what the agenda might be. Okay, so wake up, commute, networking, networking. Give me a break, that's clever. Um, here's a bunch of editorial magazines and uh, television shows who have written about Nutshell. She made it up, right? Uh, scroll down, beautiful um, quote from uh, Thoreau, uh, also Natsuki, probably the same photo shoot, right? So if you're going to like set up the lights, get a whole bunch of photos. You don't know how you're going you're gonna to need them. And let's go down <laughs> to the shop. Okay, so the Nutshell Go, registered trademark, pretty great name, right? The Nutshell Blackout, an even better name, but she had to sew another nutshell. Oh no, more work. But she knew how to sew, right? So it's perfect. The Bose head shell, which by all, uh, all accounts was a complete and total disaster. But she put it up there anyway, because she had spent the time like fighting with this prototype. Uh, the hood shell, great name, illustrator. The shell seat, kind of stole this illustrator geometry and stuck a thing on the bottom. Coming soon, and then USA Made, which everybody loves and will be important. OK, so then there's an app. There's a Nutshell Labs app because everything has a fucking app. Right? So what does the Nutshell app do? No login screen. I talked about that today. Right? Two calls to action, listen and create. Right away, something's going on here. Right? Like, I don't know what that button does, but it does something. Right? So the curiosity is raised immediately. So guided meditations, podcasts, community, don't know what that is yet, music. I can understand these other ones, okay? Um, and just mocked up. So this is where it gets really interesting. Create your own recording and share your story. So how many people are really good at like reading bedtime stories to their like niece or nephew or something like that, or kid, right? Or like ghost stories, right? So like maybe you're really good at that, so you could um, download the Nutshell Lab app and record your story and maybe share it on social media and other people's kids could listen to it or other people or it's poetry or I don't know what it is. But all of a sudden this is a whole other thing. Um, this is, right, crowdsourced. It is co-created in like a really beautiful sense, right? Because it's a lab. If it's not a lab, then this part probably isn't here, right? So just that, that reframe. Okay, so we, oh, and then, like, you gotta love Eden Lou. 
she mocks up the fake Instagram page, although she probably just posted these pictures on Instagram. But look at this, nutshelling. Now it's a verb, <laughs> right? Where's Terry? I think she's nutshelling. You know, uh, hashtag nutshelling. Okay, so um, we're very excited about this, and we publish it on the department blog pretty quick, and it goes nuts, right? Nuts to the tune of 335,000 views in like 20 hours um, on BuzzFeed, right? Um, and it's published everywhere. And Eden Liu is uh, on week seven of her two-year graduate program, and clearly she needs to drop out of school and make nutshells, <laughs> right? And she's like literally like up for 72 hours. She's like doing radio interviews. We're doing like media training, you know, radio interviews in like Hungary at 3 a.m. And, you know, the students are aware of what's going on, but something very weird is going on. Um, and, then, uh, and then I get the call from uh, the container store. And he's like, you know, hey, Alan. I'm like, hey. And he goes, you got to take it down. And like, I know. You can't really take things down on the internet. But I said, I know, we'll take it down. Uh, it was already everywhere. And he says, the other thing is you have to make your change contain yourself. We own that too. And I'm like, what? Because it was so perfect for this. He goes, do you want me to send you the trademark paperwork? And I said, sure, like, that would be a great like, teachable moment. He was like, super nice about the whole thing. Um, and then I realized contain yourself is actually on their bags. Right? So, so no one knows what to do. Right? Clearly, the world wants nutshells, because the reason why he's calling is because people are going into the container store and asking for the nutshell. Right? They don't read design blogs. Right? People are wanting this thing. And so the, the staff is just like, um, we don't have any more. Right? And so they take their phone. They're like, here it is. Or like, if like, we don't make that, it's just like, yes, you do. And they're not going to say, well, that's really a piece of fictional design or speculative design or really what's known as critical design and it's uh, design fiction. It's not really a prototype. Uh, and um, so she doesn't know what to do. And this is a dilemma, I think, for everybody. So I said, well, like, Eden, like, is the thing any good? Because we hadn't done any testing. That wasn't, like, part of the, part of the course. And she goes, well, it's kind of hot in there. <laughs> Like, it wasn't any good, right? Um, and I think I wanted to stop with that one. Yeah. That's okay. All right. Um, I want to I take just a second um, just for some sales. So we have an open house coming up um, super soon. Uh, and we do this fun thing called the Open House Design Challenge, if you know people who are interested in graduate school, um, where we will help fly them in, uh, pay for airfare, to get them to New York. They don't have to like, apply the program or anything. Um, and then we do, we're doing like three uh, design challenges each year. And it's just like one drawing and two paragraphs. It's not like a design competition. It's really an idea competition. Now I can go to this side of the room, because I know you're interested there. Uh, so if Nike and Slack launched a new initiative together, what would it be? Uh, you can call it out if you already like, have one, if you know the answer. Uh, design a piece of luggage for people who are afraid of flying and sketch an app to increase political activism. Anyway, so if you know of somebody who, uh, in some sense, like, ought to be in design, um, who's really looking for impact, and um, we don't require design backgrounds in the program, um, you could send them this, and it could be a fun thing, and they can come um, see the place and hang out with some of the students. Anyway, thank you so much. Cool. Mm -hmm. I certainly will. Mm -hmm. Or complaints. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or manifestos to share. Hey. Thank you for a lovely talk, Alan. And a, and a very full kind of meal in many pieces. Thanks, Jim. Um I'm wondering about the, the sensibility of uh, interventionism that you talk about. I mean, that's not quite the word you use. But, uh, it's beautifully put. But, you. Um, you know, enlightenment, sensitivity, mm -hmm. behavior change, these kinds of invitations to your students to, uh, to honor the hunches that they have about yeah. what, what the world is calling for yeah. um, and to do something about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, 
if you recruit specifically for that sensibility oh. or if you're kind of taking people in who just want to get a job at Facebook All or just right. want to kind of, you know, serve the machine yeah. and somehow inoculate them. Such a great question. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, I mean, I don't mean to cut you off. That's, no, that's uh, good. Um, so... I mean, there may be some, like, of course, there's biases going, going on all the time when we're meeting students and looking at their portfolios, their resumes, their life experience, interviewing them. Like, it would be silly to say that there isn't some filtering going on. But I, I think the answer is no, we don't filter for that. We are looking for, like, exceptional people. And I don't mean the word exceptional like the word, like, excellence. Like, like exceptions. Like, just people who are different, who like have something to say, they don't know how to say it, they don't have the tools for design, or they have design degrees, and the degrees that they have don't, they understand that there are skills and, and, and you know, capacities, competencies that they don't have, that they, they understand that they need to have to do the kind of work that they want to do. But to your question of, um, do they have a point of view or an agenda, right? Um, and so the answer is, I think that we're trying to do a really good job in surfacing that out of anybody. We literally have a course called Point of View. Um, Rob Walker teaches it. It's funny, actually, because I, I contacted him. I said, you know, hey, so SVA had approached me about creating a new master's program, and I'm just putting together some sort of speculative you know, list of courses. Um, and I thought that it would be really interesting to have a course called Point of View. And he's like, what's that? And I said, I don't know. That's why I'm calling you. <laughs> He's like, well, what would, you, what would you want me to teach? And I said, I just have a feeling that point of view might be the most important thing at all. And I wonder if it could be taught at a graduate level. Um, and it's, it, it's turned out to be like one of the absolute most successful favorite um, courses. Um, there his, uh, his vocabulary, you know, there's like talking around like authenticity and bullshit would be... Um, to sort of, uh, when, we, when I talk about the continuum, um, we teach an enormous amount of soft skills in the program, maybe more than hard skills. Um, and we have courses um, in um, implicit bias, in like, you know, feminism and banking, um, in, you know, lots around race. Um, I do some things that you can also um, like uh, take or borrow. Um, which is um, I have our international students present in their own language on the third class of the program, of a two-year program. But the Americans and Canadians, like the English speakers, aren't allowed to use English. Um, I used to teach ESL, and um, we take um, lots of international students whose English might not be like at a number that lots of departments would insist on. Um, but they can speak so well in so many other languages. And so when you get them like, you know, on stage showing the work, speaking in their own language, it's revelatory because um, other students will see them at full power for the first time, and it will change how they see them versus somebody who's really sort of body language timid or struggling through the language, you know, trying to convert into English and trying to sound articulate. And the fact of the matter is you can understand everything um, like perfectly. But you see them at full power. And then, of course, you flip the privilege where the, the English students, English, native English-speaking students, can't, can't use their language. Um, and so some of them do like you know, bad high school Spanish or um, sign language or emoji. We've had mime. But they really, really struggle. And so the mechanics of the actual language of like I'm able to like put on a big show and talk, talk, talk versus show, show, show. I think is well established. But to your point, the cultural nuances that come through are just, they're so complex, I, I can't even comment on it. There's so many other things happening in that room, it is like remarkable. Um, and then this year, for the first time, I kind of upped the ante where the week after that, you were allowed to present in, your, in English, or you know, everyone present in English, but the critique had to happen in your own language. And there was an amazing exchange between um, several of the Chinese students where when, when the women was presenting a piece of work and somebody like asked a question that I guess was funny and the whole room just like erupted, right? And there was this amazing exchange between four or five of the Chinese students, right? And like they were clearly having a great time and something brilliant clearly had just happened. And so 
after, I don't know, like 90 seconds, one of the students turns to me and she says, so do you want me to um, translate? And I said, no, actually. Um, I feel really shitty that I couldn't understand what was going on and that something clearly marvelous happened in the class and that I didn't have access to it. And yeah, this feels bad and I actually this is a really, I think, useful feeling to have. So we try and put in just a lot of not just talking and learning and reading, but trying to like live an experience that's going to, and I know that this is really like overshooting. I don't know how else to say it, like build a moral compass. And like, maybe don't quote me on that term, because uh, that seems very, I don't know, obnoxious. But just all the stuff that matters, like, you know, a skilled designer with nothing to say and no point of view and without a kind of like, you know, moral agenda, whatever morals that we choose to agree or disagree on, I think is a really dangerous thing. Then they're just a mass producer or a propagandist. Um, I think it's more important. So the hard skills complemented with the soft skills, complemented with the longest answer in human design lecture history <laughs> is really the right combination. So, yeah. I promise the next answer would be super quick. Mm -hmm. if you, oh, I think I have, did I make an image for you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Nobody has any more questions? Uh, Alan, I, I loved your presentation. My question for you is, what do the students find most challenging of, of the briefs that you give them or the situations that you create? Also, such a good question. Um, not the skills. I have to say, it's been a while, but like this semester, this first year um, group that I'm teaching, I don't even assign them homework anymore. Like after the two or three weeks, I'm just like, I literally said, your homework is to bring in awesome stuff every week that's awesome. <laughs> Bye. You know, and then there'd be like a couple of things like do a fake press release or um, one week they just wanted to learn a new skill. So the students who um, wanted, had never mocked up an app, like just learned Adobe XD in like one week. Uh, 3D modeling takes a little bit more than one week, it turns out, but that student actually got pretty far. Um, on 3D modeling, on Rhino. Um, so it's not, the, it's not the hard stuff, I think, that they, that they worry about. You know, they are in their heads, for sure. Um, as, much, as much light of it that I make about graduate students, it's just they're playing for keeps. They've chosen to come back to school. It's really expensive. The time commitment is enormous. And they don't want to make mistakes. They don't want to waste their time. So I think that there is a lot of like pre-calculation on, listen, what I'm looking at is going to be seven hours. Is it the right move? Um, and I don't actually think that that's, I don't think you can train that out of people. That's just, you know, human nature, and they're trying to, um, you know, sort of minimize risk, I think. Um, do they worry about other things? I mean, they for sure worry about jobs. I mean, which is also normal. We do really well there. Our students like get great jobs, and um, they're generalists for sure. Um, and each one of them will have a specialist, like a specialty, um, or a couple. Um, but you know, it's pretty entrenched in the department that you need to be able. It's back to my first slide. Like you need to be conversant on really, like no joke, every single one of these things. You need to know how VCs talk. Right, and that they're interested in two things, like time and money, and that they could be selling shoes in another age. They're selling money right now, um, or bets, um, and largely software, apps, or platforms. But you need to meet VCs and to really understand. You under, have to understand like supply chain and like life cycle analysis or assessment. Um, you need to have coded Arduino and understood like what the privacy ramifications are of building smart objects. Um, and I think some of them might worry that they're not. When someone says, what kind of designer are you? Or I don't know what kind of designer you are, that that scares them. And I have a flippant answer, which is like, well, then you don't get to hire them. 
you know, that's easy to say. Um, but I think that that is a genuine concern that they're so broad um, that nobody will be able to like sort of put them in a box, which again is, um, I don't think that that's a good thing. So sometimes um, I find myself saying, I know you're worrying about your first job, but like, you know, I'm worrying about your next job. That's very much a, like a leadership program in that, in that regard. At a time when maybe they're not seeing themselves quite there because especially the ones without design degrees are still trying to just get up to speed where they feel competent with their, you know, their hands. Um, do you see this kind of practice in thinking at an undergrad level? Like, if so, kind of where, if not, like, why, and how? Uh, you know, it's an important question because you have so much time in undergraduate. Um, you know, typically there is a kind of foundation year. Is there a foundation year here? Um, but then when you get into specialties, they still really are, you know, for industrial design, it's a lot of like, you know, trans, like automotive or furniture um, or like um, soft goods. Um, and those are really, really exciting areas. Uh, and the, you have the time to specialize. So you really do end up being like this amazing person who can render sneakers and backpacks and all of these incredible soft goods with, you know, great design, high fidelity, like super skills. But some of these larger questions, I think, often aren't asked in undergraduate. I mean, I think it's really changing. I think every design school is, like, really starting to understand the power that design, you know, can have. I mean, I really do believe, like, almost nobody understands what design is or what it can do. And I think most designers don't understand what, what they're capable of because they're defining it, and this is going off on a ramp, but they're defining it as being in the service of industry. That design, I mean, literally people say designers are in the service of industry. Um, and that, that phrase makes me sick. It really does. Like, you know, that's, you, should, you know, industry, like designers need to be setting the agenda, not serving industry who like wants to sell stuff. Um, but that's not really taught, I don't know if you teach it, it's not really fortified in, in a designer, particularly a young designer. Um, but I, I choose to believe more and more. You know, I talk to a lot of educators, and everyone's pretty on the same page about, you know, that this is a force for, for good, um, and it needs to be wielded, like, very strategically um, and sort of more broadly. But I do believe that you can't play unless you can speak people's languages. There's so much specialization in the world because everything is so complex. Um, and I'm actually very pro-jargon. I think that jargon is great and that that's the way that you can understand a subculture is how they talk. Um, but because everything is so siloed and so narrow and so specialized and the jargons are so dense and deep that people literally can't talk to each other. They literally don't use the same words to communicate what their practice is about and maybe most importantly what their metrics of success are and why. And so I see designers as these this connective tissue between all of these different, you know, verticals, these specialties, and designers as translators um, who can see that in some sense many people are on the same team. They just can't, don't, and won't talk to each other. But they can't play if they can't talk to each of these stakeholders. This is what I'm so convinced of, that there's just, they can't be effective. Um, and that's why they have to learn all of these different things in order to have these fluencies or at least to be conversant in so many of these areas where they connect people, different stakeholders who think that they have conflicting agendas but may not. Using design can actually make this beautiful equation um, between multiple stakeholders with often um, you know, seemingly conflicting agendas, which may not be true at all. You know, I think there's a huge like, um, bright side to this. Anyway, you've been super generous with your time, everybody. Thank you so much. So a pleasure to be here. Thank you.